Hey everyone, we're going to be talking about T-scores, which are very similar to Z-scores, and they are going to allow us to conduct T-tests, which are way better than Z-tests. So let's get started. Now like I said, T-scores and Z-scores are really similar to each other, except that T-scores are a little bit bigger. Let's talk about that. Now the reason that T-scores are bigger is because they include a penalty for using a low sample size and for calculating the sta sample standard deviation and assuming that the sample standard deviation is the same thing as the population standard deviation. Now we're going to head over to the computer and take a look at a T-chart together. I'll see you guys there. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit of bad news, but we are going to need to learn a new table. And this table is also going to have some numbers all over the place. But it's really important that we understand the difference between T-scores and Z-scores and why we use one instead of the other. You should always use T-scores. Just period. Here's why. When you do a study, you're calculating the standard deviation and you're also going to have a low sample size. There are problems with this. For one, if you calculate your standard deviation, you're calculating the sample standard deviation, the standard deviation of your sample. You're not calculating the standard deviation of the population. No one can figure that out anyways. So because your sample might be a little biased or might be a little skewed, we're going to throw a little bit of a punishment towards you, a little bit of a consequence. We're going to take Z star and we're going to make it into T star which is going to be a value that's a little bit higher. So that 1.96 that we were working with earlier is going to be a little bit larger than 1.96 because you're calculating the sample standard deviation and I don't trust your number. The other thing is that your sample size is going to be small. If you remember, according to the central limit theorem, um, that as your sample size gets larger and larger, your, the, the distribution will become more and more normal. So we're pretending like, you know, these uh, sample distributions are actually bell curves. They're not. You should go back to that central limit theorem uh, section of this course and take a look at how the sample distributions, those blue curves, weren't always bell curves. And they weren't bell curves when the sample size was small. Technically, they never were bell curves. And because of that, there should be a, another additional punishment, like a tax raised on your Z star. We're going to call it T star, and it's going to be a little bit larger. Now, let me explain how to read this chart real quick. Let me make um, a quick edit. Um, in particular, I'm going to draw on this. There we go. Okay, so um, what I recommend is printing out this chart, pause the video, print this out, and then grab a pen and we're gonna do some things real quick. So pause the video now and then we'll come back when you have that, everything ready. Okay, so let's talk about how to read this thing. First off, what I want you to do is completely get rid of this one tail crap right here. I still haven't conceptualized one tailed test in general so there's just no reason why we need this. And I don't think there should ever be a reason why we need this. Now, um, I would actually get rid of maybe the cumulative probability. Technically no reason we need that either. So last we have this two-tailed ta uh, row. The first thing I want you to realize is that these values right here are called, these values are called um, are p-values. Some people use alpha to represent these numbers. So um, this would correspond to a 95% confidence interval. This would correspond to an 80% confidence interval. It's basically that error that we're allowing. So um, the p-value corresponds to the error, whereas that 95% corresponds to the part that's not the error. So uh, this, these proportions just tell me how often I'm wrong, which is like 5% of the time or 20% of the time. And then the actual confidence interval percentage that we use is the percentage of the time that we are actually correct. 
So um, it's important to understand that this column right here is the 95% column. So we're probably going to be using these, these T-scores a lot. Now, these are all T-scores. Now, how do we read this? Which T-score do we take? Because if we're using a 95% Z-score, we would take 1.96. But what about a 95% T-score? Well, we actually go to over here to figure out which T-score we use. And these are called degrees of freedom. Now, this is going to be kind of weird how this works. But the idea is you take N, the, the, your sample size, and you subtract 1. And that will give you your degrees of freedom. Now, why do we do that? Don't ask questions. Asking questions is wrong. No, but seriously, this is absolutely ridiculous. I have no idea why they do this. Um, I would just use N, to be honest, because when I conduct a study, I'm just kind of interested in what T-score I use, and I don't want to do any additional math when I don't have to, for no reason. But too bad. Sorry. You're going to have to subtract one, and that will tell you your degrees of freedom. So if, for example, you sample 10 people, you're going to have to, uh, and you're doing a 95% confidence interval. Here's where uh, the sample size is 10. But we're not going to use that one because we need to do n minus 1, which would be 9. <laughs> so we're going to use this row and this column because that's the 95% column, which would correspond to a t score of 2.262. Let's try another one. What if n equals, let's do 17. Then we're going to look at the degrees of freedom being 16. Our confidence interval is going to be 95%. So it looks like 2.12. Now I'm going to go back to this T table and I'm going to point out something that's really important here about this T table. So let me go to full screen mode. Now down here you can actually see at the very bottom these uh, confidence levels. So this column right here that I highlighted that says 95%, that column represents the 95% confidence interval column. And if you notice, the number right above it is 1.96. So if you're ever wondering what Z star is, you can always look at this for like, for example, the 80% confidence interval, Z star is 1.282. For the 60% confidence interval, Z is 0.842 and so on. So just keep in mind that um, this table actually tells you what the corresponding uh, critical values are. Now, if you want to learn how to calculate the critical values, we've done lectures on that before. Make sure you check out that section where we were mastering the uh, standard normal distribution. Now, real quick, I want you to take a look at this 1.96. Now, this is a sample size of 1,001. Because keep in mind, there are degrees of freedom. You have to add one if you want to figure out what the sample size was. That's a pretty big sample size. And if you notice, the T-score here, and I'm going to actually real quick pull up our annotation so that you can see what I'm looking at here. So I'm looking at large sample size. The T-score is really, really close to 1.96, which is in theory the perfect number that you would use if your distribution, your sample distribution was a perfect bell curve and you had the, the population standard deviation and everything was working out for you. But that's not the case. You don't, you don't ever interview one, um, uh, an infinite number of people and then try to guess what the actual population, standard, or po population average is. It's not how it works. So if you notice real quick, with this column right here. As the sample size gets smaller and smaller, the T-scores get larger and larger. And that's because when your sample sizes are smaller, your T-scores your T are going to be larger to account for the error that you should expect. I mean, you should be punished for having a, uh, a sample size that's relatively small. And that punishment is going to correspond to your sample size. So the larger your sample size, the less that T-score is going to really take away from that, uh, is really going to hurt you.
But the idea is this T star is really meant to make it more difficult to prove people wrong. It's meant to make uh, tests and experiments harder because you should have a higher bar for not being able to know what the population standard deviation is and for having a very small sample size. So let's go over one example. Let's say we have n equals, let's do 61. Well, what T star would we use if we're doing a 95% confidence interval? Well, here's 95% confidence interval and we would use df equals 60. The degrees of freedom is 60 because 61 minus one is 60, which by the way is right here. And that would correspond to a T star of two. And so now every single formula that we've ever used, particularly with confidence intervals, T star, uh, Z star is just gonna turn into T star. So instead of using 1.96 for a 95% confidence interval, in this case, we would use a T star of two. Now I wanna mention one more thing. Notice how when the degrees of freedom get really, really small, and I'm gonna make annotations here so we can see this more clearly. Oops, that was the wrong screen to use. Let's try that again. There we go. When the degrees of freedom are like one, two, or three, meaning your sample size was two, three, or four, look at these T stars. 12.71, 4.30, 3.1, 2.776. Those numbers are huge compared to the number 1.96. It's going to make your margin of error much larger. And you should be punished for using a small sample size like that. I mean, you still can totally go for it. It's just not going to work out for you that well. Now keep in mind also, technically, can the degrees of freedom be zero? The answer is yes. There should be a row where the degrees of freedom are zero. What would the corresponding T scores be if your sample size was one. And this would be the number, infinity, 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 across the board, regardless of what confidence interval you're using. The idea is, and I know an infinity is not a number and you can you know, talk about that some other time, but the idea is if your sample size gets so low, your margin of error is going to blow up. So if you use um, a sample size of one, your margin of error should not be zero. It should be as big as physically possible. So the idea is, again, you should never have a sample size of one and make a claim about what the average is. So for example, if you go walking down the street and you interview someone, you ask, what's your IQ? And they say, oh, it's like 142. You can never make a claim about the, uh, the average of the population. You say, oh, that means that the average IQ is like 142. No, you need to sample at least two people. And I know a sample size of two people sounds really small, but you can actually still make that work because your T star in this case would be 12.71, which is absolutely ridiculous, but sure, go for it. People do it, it's happened, just not very smart. Go and ask someone else, please. Make it life a little bit easier for yourself. Thank you guys so much, I'll see you in the next lecture. You just watched a video from Amore Learning. We provide free math videos and we offer many online courses. We also provide free math tutoring via YouTube Live every Thursday and Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like this video to get access to all of our free content. And put a comment in the comment section if you have any math questions. Check out all of our courses on amorelearning.org.